Good morning, everybody. Somebody made a comment this morning about uh, me in getting involved in uh, Keep Fit exercises, but uh, yes, that's exactly what I'm here for this morning, and I hope that's what we're all here for, but it's of a spiritual kind that we're going to be having this morning. Uh, we're going to be painting some pictures this morning, and um, I'm going to offer you two pictures, and the children that are here can, uh, I know they are better at doing such things, so they can uh, get engaged with that. If they have their painting stuff, any rough work they have, they can, you know, begin to do some painting. Um, now, let's read the portion of our scriptures so that as we read, uh, the children will be able to pick up what we're reading and they, they may be able to reproduce that in their, uh, in their own way. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just paint what comes to you. And I'm going to read two portions of scriptures in Matthew chapter 13, two portions, verses 1 to 9 and verses 18 to 23. And as I read those two portions, I want to see what forms in your mind, what kind of picture or pictures form in your mind. I read the first one, Matthew 13, verses 1 to 9, verses 1 to 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, the second portion begins in verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with that picture or something similar to that picture, uh, which we have all seen at one point or the other in our Sunday school lessons or books and all of that. It's a parable of the sower. We usually see a figure like that man there with a saddlebag, dips his hand in the bag, brings out seeds, and scatters them all over the place. It's a picture of a farmer at work sowing seeds. Now, the landscape is very beautiful, you know, it's wonderful, it's panoramic, and it has a pastoral feel. Now, what's at stake here from our first portion, the first portion we read, is the the seeds that the sower sows, the soils, the birds, the sun, the harvest. It's just nature, and it's a purely agricultural picture. Again, as I said, the one that we are 
used to from our Sunday school uh, books and lessons. Now, that's the first picture, which is in the first portion that I read, verses 1 to 9. Now, I want us to look on another picture, the second picture. And these are the two pictures I bring this morning. The second picture is from uh, verse 18 to 23. And when we come to this portion, which I've already read, things begin to change from a purely agricultural picture to a much more serious spectacle. Now, let's paint that picture. In those verses, we see that the sower is Jesus Christ, not just any ordinary farmer. The seed that is sown is the word of God. The path, the rocky ground, and the thorns, and the good soil, they become human beings. It's like something out of science fiction. Now think about it. The footpath, rocky ground, thorns, becoming human beings, standing up. And of course the birds become a personality. Our reading in Matthew says, is the evil one. That's what he calls the birds. It's the devil. Luke calls him the devil. Mark calls him Satan. Because all three, gosp- three of these Gospels have uh, the same story, the same parable. And the entire landscape is no longer a farm, but a residential space. A community like we we have here, a town, a village, a city, a nation. And the picture which now emerges is totally different to the first which we saw. Here it is no longer a purely agricultural matter that has temporary or seasonal consequences. It is no longer about disposable seeds and birds, not about soils and sun and harvest. Instead, It is a picture of God and people on one side and the devil and his strategies on the other side. It is a picture of souls that never die and the enemy of those souls. It is a picture of war. It is a matter of life and death. Now, I I know that it is no longer a popular thing today to think of the gospel and the kingdom of God in terms of war. And I'm not talking about this congregation. Over the past 50 years, we have changed many of the things in the life of the church to strip the gospel of the image and the imagery of war. We have changed many of our hymns, but thank God we still sing a lot of them. In fact, a lot of the songs we sang here this morning still depict the imagery of war. The very last one is a perfect one for that. But in many places, you won't find those kind of songs being sung anymore. On what Christian soldiers will thrown it away. Stand up, stand up for Christ, for Jesus. In a lot of places, they won't sing it anymore, but I know we'll sing that here. But you see, the Bible is a very stubborn thing. Very stubborn. It has refused to change, and it simply refuses to change. And when you turn to the Bible, after all the changes that we have made and tried to make in the life of the church universal, you are embarrassed to find that it has not changed. That from Genesis to Revelation, it still remains the same. And it still tells us it is a book about the great war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Right from the Garden of Eden to the final battle of Armageddon. And then the final judgment where some go to heaven and others go to hell. Now we don't like to hear that, but that's the truth of the word of God. And that's the most embarrassing embarrassing thing about the word of God, that it refuses to change. It remains stubborn, but we want to change it. The whole of the world wants to change it. 
and some parts of the church want to change it. But the Bible refuses. Now, let's visit the theater of war in the second picture that I'm trying to paint and see the battle in operation. And we're going back to verse 18 of our reading. And that's the second portion. In verse 18... I begin from 19, verse 19, it says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. Now, this is the person who does not understand the word of God, the gospel. And why does he not understand? Let me read in Luke, uh, very quickly, chapter 8, Uh, Verse 12, where this same uh, parable is is, uh, narrated. Uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 12. It says, The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Now the same thing Paul tells us through the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I read verses 3 and 4, and Paul is lamenting here how people are rejecting the gospel. And he says, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, the difficulty here is a lack of understanding. And we see that the source of that difficulty is Satan. Now, the second one is verses 20 to 21. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately He falls away. This is the one who is not rooted in the word of God. And the difficulty here is persecution or trouble or tribulation. When that comes, the person falls away. And again, who is behind that? Who is behind persecution? Who is behind all the troubles of this world? All the wars and the quarrels and acrimony and animosity. All the difficulties. Who is behind them? We know it's Satan. The third portion is verse 22. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. This is a person who loves the world. And we know that the love of the world is one of the things that wars against our souls as believers. It pulls us down, and we are warned against it again and again and again throughout scriptures. The difficulty, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, you know, how we want to have earthly pleasures and earthly paradises and earthly whatever. And again, the source of that difficulty is Satan. Now, the final portion is verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil... This is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This obviously is the victorious one. He hears the word of God, understands it, bears fruit. And that's very crucial. The believer reproduces. He is not alone. He is not alone. From one believer, we get So many believers, if that believer bears fruit according to what God wants. Now, the victorious one is victorious because he or she alone is the one who had ears to hear. Go back to verse 9 of our reading. It says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's what Christ said when he had finished saying that parable. And he was speaking to the crowds at this time. He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the second part that I read, he was speaking privately to his disciples, explaining 
the parable to them. And the disciples were those who were willing to hear. That's what it means, he who has ears to hear. Those who are willing to hear what God is saying. Those who indeed want to obey God, they go deeper. They go forward. They are not merely curious about the word of God. They want to know the import of the word of God, what it entails, and how they can obey. They are the ones who have ears, and they are the ones who hear, because they are the ones who are willing. Now, some people think that we speak too much of the devil, and that we give him more credit than is due him. And they have a point. I can see that. But the other wrong is to think too little of him or to deny him any existence or power as many do today and want the church to do. That's disastrous. Because the, the scriptures teach us that Satan is the god of this world. We read it already. That the whole world lies in the power of Satan that Satan was once a leading personality in heaven, and he fell. He is extremely charming and deceitful beyond all measure. Satan is the one who stole paradise from Adam and Eve. And he's been around longer than any of us here. He's been around longer. None of us is going to live up to 200 years, 300 years. Not anymore. But Satan has been around long before we were born. He will be here long after we've gone until Christ returns. And the Bible tells us that he, Satan, knows the Bible. And he knows it very well. And he uses it not to the glory of God, but to pull us down to destroy us. Just think of the, the, the temptations of Jesus and how he used the Bible deceitfully to pull him down. The Bible tells us he's a thief, he's a liar, he's a killer, and the destroyer. There is no other destroyer but Satan. And he's God's enemy. And because he's God's enemy, he's also our enemy. And right now he goes about like a roaring lion seeking the people of God to devour them, to eat them, to finish them, to destroy them. And his goal, ultimately, we are taught in scriptures, is to take us with him to hell. Hell was made for him and for his fallen angels, the demons, not for human beings. But those who go with him, who allow him to deceive them, will end up with him there. And that's what he's doing. That's his goal. Surely, we cannot think too little of such a dangerous enemy. And this is why Christ offers his disciples this second picture. He would have left it at the first picture. You know, that first picture is totally harmless. In fact, when I look at that picture, what it does to me is an invitation to sit down, cross my legs, relax, have a cup of coffee nearby, and close my eyes and meditate and dream away. That's what it says to me. It's a beautiful picture. It's lovely. It has its place. But that's not where Christ stopped. Christ went on further with those who were willing to obey him. And in private, he instructed them and gave them explanation. And this is the picture. This second picture is what he, gave, he gives them. And from this second picture, he wanted them to see not the agricultural thing that is there, but he wanted them to see, number one, the active presence of Satan in the world. Very active. Satan is very active. The, very, the first three categories of hearers, they fell and they were unproductive because of Satan. No one else. It had nothing to do with birds or thorns or whatever. It's Satan. The second thing is you wanted them to know that the world is a battleground. It's not a playground at all. Some parts of the church would like us to believe today that, oh, we are here to have fun. Yes, by all means, as human beings, we do have some fun, but that's not why we're here. The world is a battleground, and we are soldiers. 
of Jesus Christ in the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Those are the two kingdoms. Thirdly, Christ wanted them to know that the very souls of men and women, your souls, my soul, are the prize of the war. That's what's at stake. The souls, never dying souls of human beings. That's what's at stake. The eternal destiny of the individual. That's what's at stake. Where are we going to spend eternity? Will it be in heaven with God, which is his plan? Or will it be, God forbid, in the other place, which is horrible? Nobody wants to go there. But until we see this second picture clearly for what it is, a picture of war, we will not have the sense of urgency and vigilance to do the work that God has given us to do here and to have the right perspective to live as Christians in the world. People who are not of the world, though they are in the world. And finally, Jesus wanted them to see this picture because he wanted them to know that they can and will do something about it. That's why Jesus came. And that's why he chose those disciples to carry on the mission for which he came. And in private, as he is instructing them, explaining this parable to them, he is training them for the work of the mission. Let me read a couple of verses more. In that same chapter, in verse 51, it says, Have you understood all these things? Because there were a lot of other parables he talked about. And he explained them all to, to them. And they said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. He is training the disciples to be workers for his kingdom, to do what he himself came to do. He said to them at one point, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And that extends to all of us. These are the same challenges that Matthew, when he wrote this book, wanted to convey to his first readers in the first century. And it is the same challenges that the Holy Spirit, through the same gospel, is bringing us today who live in the 21st century. No matter how diversified the atmosphere is today, no matter how postmodern we have become, no matter how multi this, multi that, and multi everything that we have become, it is this same, these same challenges that the Holy Spirit is bringing to us today who live 21 centuries after it was first written. And the Holy Spirit wants us to know that Satan is still as active in the world as he was in the past, as he has ever been. That the world is a battleground and that the souls of human beings are at stake. And that we are here today called by God as his collaborators in the gospel mission. And the meaning of all that for us, for you and I, is one, to stay rooted in the word of God. Stay with the word of God. Because until we can hold on to the word of God, we will be blown away by all the I mean, fast-moving waves and streams of uh, uh, theologies and uh, philosophies and all sorts of thinkings that the world is producing and manufacturing at a very fast rate. We will be blown away. We will have no point of reference to be able to cross-check whether what we are hearing from this or that or there is true or not. The only reference point is the Word of God. And I want to encourage you, beloved, to read the Word of God. It is God's own love letter to you. That's how personal it is. It is His love letter to you. And let me tell you, you may not believe this, it takes only 90 hours to read the Bible from Genesis first chapter to Revelation last chapter. Nine, zero, 90 hours. In three months, you can read it all four times a year if you wanted to. Now, if you don't want to go that fast, you can at least spare 15 minutes a day. Everybody can spare that out of 24 hours. If you do it 15 minutes a day, you read the whole Bible in one year. 
Now, if you increase that to 30 minutes, you read it in six months. Now, how about reading the Bible at least once a year, for starters? Because the more you read it, the more you know what God wants you to know. The more you are clearer about the big picture he wants you to have. And the stronger you become in battle because it's, it's your weapon. Think of a soldier going to wherever in the world to fight a battle without his guns, without his knives, without his armor, without uh, you know, all what the things he needs. Think of that. He's just going to be picked up and plucked, plucked up and that's the end of the person. The word of God is our armor. And the second thing is, and this is so crucial, beloved, that we not only have the word of God and deepen ourselves in it, but that we sow it. That's the whole essence of that parable, that we sow the word. We evangelize. And I know that you have a vision for evangelism in this place. Thank God for that. We need to deepen that. Take the word out, out there. There are lots of unbelievers around us. Now, look at that picture. Not the first one, the second picture. If you change things around, I mean, take, take away the first one, hold on to the second picture. Forget your Sunday school picture of the parable of the sower and hold on to this one, this picture of war, the real one of conflict. And then you begin to see that we need to get on the move. We need to get on the move. We are soldiers. That's what we are. That's what we are called to be. And we must reproduce our kind. We cannot sit down here day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out, and it's the same number that we are. No, we can challenge ourselves that in one year, one year, let each person bring at least one person. Because various studies have shown that the best and most effective evangelical tool or tool of evangelism is one person bringing one person. So just get a friend, get a neighbor, get a relative, a, friend, a family member who is not yet a church person and invite them. Pray for them. Go on your knees. Do everything you can do. Let the church itself pray and cry out to God for the souls of men and women because every day they drop dead. Without Christ, I dare not mention where, what's their fate. Because it's horrible if we follow the scriptures and we have nothing else to follow. Let's at least strive and fight in this battle to bring in one person every year. And if we are 200 here today, by this time next year we'll be 400. And by this time, two years hence, we'll be how many? 800. Just continue to repeat that. Now, in 10 years, you will need to pull down the structure or at least replicate the structure many times over in different places in this community to be able to take in the number of people who are coming. And that is the will of God. We cannot say it's impossible. It is possible. We cannot say it's not doable. It is doable. What God wants done is doable. What God's will is must stand. All we need to do is wake up and collaborate with God. And I pray that God will help us with that picture at the back of our mind to rise to the challenge as individuals and as a church of God here in Christ Church. In Jesus' name, amen.